So our question um, tonight is how will coronavirus change how we're governed? Um, at our open news thinking on Tuesday, this question came up of whether coronavirus offers a moment of reckoning and a reset to our systems. Um, I've had conversations in other thinkings over the last 24 hours about how it's changing the NHS and how it's changing the exam system and how it's changing even the courts and justice system. But tonight we're talking about how is it going to change our system of government. Um, so I want to start with a little practice of our hand raising. Um, so I'm going to ask a question and raise your hand if you agree. Raise your hand if you believe we will return to business as usual, normal government and politics when this is all over. Raise your hand. In, so not many of you, but I can see... I can see those of you who have got your hands up and I'm definitely going to pick on you later. Robson, Chris and my colleague Katie will, will, will come to you later um, on that point. Raise your hand if you think it's going to be fundamentally changed by what we're going through at the moment. Definitely more hands going up, but yeah, more hands going up. But I like the fact that I think quite a lot of hands haven't gone up through either. So there's a more interesting gray area we, we can explore in this conversation. Um, to start with, I wanted to come to the first of our speakers. Um, so John McTernan is a political strategist. Um, he writes for the FT. Um, he was Tony Blair's director of political operations, director of comms for Julia Gillard in Australia and chief of staff to um, the leader of the Scottish Labour Party, Jim Murphy. So has has been around. Um, and now you're a fellow at a senior fellow at the Institute for Government. Yeah. Um, John, what's going to happen? Is this going to change the way we're governed? So, yes. Uh... But one thing I want to put on the table immediately is this will be a contest. So this question will be is open. It's been opened, but the ways in which it will be settled are up for debate. That's why it's great to be participating in this conversation. The first thing to say is um, not only is government back, uh, we can see it everywhere. We see it in Rishi Sunak's uh, announcement today about charities. Um, experts are back as well. We saw it at the press conference, the, you know, and the Chancellor uh, as the Prime Minister before him, Dominic Raab, Michael Gove even, flanked by experts. So government back, government's back, experts are back, but I think the terms on which they're back are up for grabs. So I thought I'd talk about uh, the international setting of governance, the UK-wide setting of governance, and then the, the national and regional setting for government within the UK. So internationally, the big question of our time of the last decade has really been globalization versus nationalism. Um, that's still around. That's been reframed by this, uh, by this pandemic. So we have Donald Trump, the president of the most powerful nation in the world, saying it's a Chinese virus, the Wuhan virus, talking about how proud he is to close his borders. He's been, he's been copied by other people in that. Uh, the Australian government have been proud about closing their borders, making China uh, the cause of this, the funds at ergo of this pandemic. Um, but equally you have Gordon Brown uh, and you have Samantha Parrish this morning on uh, the Today programme arguing, well, basically a global challenge requires a global response. What does that mean about governance? It's not really uh, going to be the main topic I suspect tonight, but basically, if you believe that is right, I do, you also have to acknowledge that multilateral institutions are flawed. Uh, any United Nations organization has deep flaws in operating, really problematic. Um, and Donald Trump is gonna pick on those, uh, the way that all UN organizations are affected by the fact that all of the member states have some influence, all the member states have a turn uh, appointing and electing. Uh, and that only a handful of states like the US and the big European Union countries do the majority of the funding. So some, re some review, some reform of multinational institutions is going to be required by those of us who believe that multinational institutions are fundamental to moving forward to ch the challenges that we face. So that's a level of governance that's really important. But if you look at the fact that international trade is still stuck in the Doha round, which has been going since the 1990s, uh, because everybody's afraid to call it and say that's over, 
you can see how difficult it is to, to move on something as, as critical as trade and trade will be an issue uh, as i discussed with, with liz trust the other day trade's going to be fundamental to the settlement in the future so there's international governance secondly there's there's the uk what's happening in the uk well this is a massive crisis that's bringing together in what in one moment is forcing through and testing every element of the state settlement at the moment uh, with a million people nearly a million people going on to universal credit in the last couple of weeks a lot of people are finding out exactly how threadbare our welfare our welfare system is how that there is it a safety net it's got lots of holes in it if it has the 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 changes that have been made immediately to universal credit have included inc increasing the housing allowance uh putting allowing extra people into it an extra discount uh for for wages that generosity which has restored really a decade of cuts is going to be really hard to unwind so is warfare welfare going to maintain into the into the new settlement that seems to be to one thing you touched uh, uh, you touched um, Polly in your instruction on the NHS change in the NHS. Most of us are probably having the experience of not being able to access our GPs directly. We're doing more telephone medicine. Uh, we're actually for work. We're actually, we're using things like this now. But it's become a part of life using Zoom, using uh, WebEx, using all the different applications, Microsoft Teams. Those changes are going to stay, I think so that uh, we might see a massive improvement in the efficiency of, uh, of, um, of, of the NHS through using much more distance medicine. You may see distance learning. Uh, you're definitely going to see a change in the university sector, the HE sector. Uh, what does it mean, though, in terms of uh, is the state going to be a big player? Well, this, to me, is, the, is, is a crucial question. And I suspect the levelling up agenda is going to be ditched because, in reality, the only agenda for a chancellor is going to be making sure that it's not a leveling down agenda for all of us. When we come out of coronavirus, it will be go for growth. It will be money spent on anything that will bring a, bring any any jobs back into uh, into the economy, any growth back into the economy at all. And I suspect there'll be a de facto separation between uh, the central government, Whitehall, Westminster seeking to drive the economy and actually trying to brigade the devolved nations into that and then saying there'll be local labor market issues there'll be local issues uh, around equality about skills around jobs about reviving business um smes over to you uh first ministers over to you mayors and city region mayors um and that will be quite a big division which is basically all about getting the economy back on its feet um because We've had a lot of money invested in furloughing. The question really is how many of those jobs are going to be coming back? Because for me, part of the discussion about government is about business. This is a crisis in which, you know, like the banking crisis, where government has stepped in. That's really important. It was essential in the global financial crisis. It's essential now. After the global financial crisis, banks didn't do their bit, definitely by the voters. They did their bit, they kept the economy going, uh, but they called in lots of loans. They did their bit, they kept the cash coming out of the cash machines, but nobody really feels that the banks paid back the support they got from us. In this, in, after we come out of all this, businesses who have been supported through this are gonna have to pay back in a very visible, very tangible, very long lasting way. They'll have a challenge because I think what we're going to see in the next 10 months is a 10 years worth of economic change happening. Some will be new things, innovation, some things will be destructive. So I don't think the high street is coming back in the same way that it was there before. That will change completely. That will require a, a, a lot of thinking about what we do. And I think what we're going to end up with is a new grand bargain. Because in a sense, the settlement of the state is a grand bargain, a grand bargain between business uh, on the one hand, workers and the community on the other hand, and the government. So all of us are involved in this question uh, of government and governance. And it's really important to remember, there's lots of wartime analogies going on. And there's something about British people that love to celebrate defeat. Um, so we like to talk about Dunkirk a terrible, terrible defeat, a disaster. What we should be thinking about is during the war, right in the middle of the war, the Butler Education Act was being formed. Beveridge was thinking about reforming the welfare state. John Reith was thinking about 
what should we do about town and country planning, which led to the new towns. That's where we need a big conversation. Some people should do the thinking, come up with the ideas, and a lot of people should do the conversation around it. Because, like I said at the beginning, this is going to be a set of questions that have been opened up, and for them to be resolved properly, and for a grand bargain to settle properly, is going to have to be, just as the lockdown is done with our consent, so the, the, the bounce back, and let's hope the bounce forward, is done with our consent too. John, thank you so much for that and for taking us from the you know macro global stuff right down to the high street. Um, um, just on that, a grand bargain. Mm. How will that process play out? What will it look like? Because the flip side to that is something my editor James Harding mm. said in our thinking the other day, which was was we're not going to have the time and space to think strategically in all of this to come out with a. With a, with a strategic kind of um, decision at the end of it, because we're so busy firefighting. Um, what do you think the process of a grand bar bargain could look so, like? So, uh, in, in a sense, I think we never have the time. Oh. We never have the time to think, but actually some of us do the thinking. And sometimes people think and think and think away and it never comes to fruition. Other times you think and think away and you work on something and it comes the moment and, you know, cometh the time, cometh the hour, cometh the idea. So I think, for example, um, I've been talking to um, the, the GLA about housing. The London, the London property market has crashed. We know that. Nothing's moving. Nobody's moving. Nothing's being sold. That means there are developers who are trading bankrupt. They have got stock they're going to have to get rid of. They will pretend to their shareholders, their banks, the, the people for their covenants, that they have still got a business to do. The mayor, the deputy mayor for housing, or the mayor has to step into that and say, we will not allow property in London to crash catastrophically. We'll take those flats off your hands. We'll keep you going. We'll keep builders in work, safely in work. But we're taking them off you at the price they are worth in a crash, not the price you've got them on your books at. You've got to take a haircut, your shareholder got to take a haircut, the bank got to take a haircut. And we're going to take those, and we're, because I'm a Labour mayor, I'm going to now take everybody in London out of temporary accommodation and put them into these flats to accommodate them properly, give them settlement, give them a settled place to live. Now, in that, you're acting tactically, you're acting opportunistically, but you're acting with a core of social justice and values. And I think that's the way this will build up. It'll come out of ideas into action some of which have been thought about before, some of which have been dreamt of before. And I think that's the other side of this, which is you don't need to have a fully formed idea if you've got a really good dream. Um, is, is there a risk that we're talking about what we want to happen rather than, than what could happen as a result of this? Yeah, no, I know. Um, I think we should talk about what we want to happen because uh, the most disappointing strand of British thought is our kind of grumbling miserableism putting up with everything mm -hmm. um we'll join any queue if we see it like will british consumers take what they're given one of the joys of living and working in australia is basically australia doesn't really have a class system because australians don't accept a class system um australia is a society where things do go wrong but they fix them because they think they're fixable whereas we're a society where things go badly and we kind of go, oh, well, shrug, move on, moan about it. We love moaning about things. We moan about the weather, we moan about things. But society, the economy is a settlement, not like the weather. The weather you can't change, although globally we're trying to destroy uh, weather systems through climate change. We can change. So we have to think, we have to dream what we want. We have to say what we want. Mm -hmm. And the thing about the bargain between politicians, uh, communities and business is, if we don't say what we want, other people tell us what we want. Thank yeah. you so much for that. That's a brilliant setting of the scene. I can see lots of hands going up. Um, I can also see a great comment from Chloe Hardy um, talking about um, that she'd like to hear about um, civil society and its role in that. And seeing as John's just taken us from the global government governance to um, a grand bargain, I wanted to introduce um, 
Adam, um, um, who is from Bristol Cable. Um, and Bristol Cable is a most fantastic publication in Bristol, um, which operates on a cooperative model. And Adam is one of the co-editors of Bristol Cable, but it's very stitched into its local community, the local politics. So now that we've done the international, the national kind of, let's hear from the local level. Adam, how do you think this situation we're going through at the moment could change the relationship between the state and its citizens? Uh, thanks, Polly. Thanks, everyone. Uh, really good int introduction and uh, food for thought. I guess what I'm going to focus on is through the lens of the mutual aid groups or the sort of uh, massive volunteer effort that's uh, sort of sprung up in response to this crisis. Um, and one of the th things I think that will it be pertinent to how we determine what, how this will affect the future of politics or how we're governed or government itself will be the different flavors that those groups have. And so in reporting in this on these mutual aid groups and being involved in some of them in, uh, in, in a little way, I think what I'm seeing is that there's definitely a divide between groups which are made up of thousands of individuals in Bristol alone who are sort of like organizing themselves with the uh, methods and politics and tone of something which is a lot more radical and fundamental in terms of talking about mutual aid in, in the style of uh, anarchist thinking and seeing that this is a moment that throws into sharp relief the failings of government to support communities or the, the impact of neoliberalism on communities over the past 30 years and that this is really like a, an opportunity to uh, fundamentally change that and then on the other hand we have the sort of more mainstream aspects of civic society and charities uh, who, who, who could sort of like, who are in, in, in a way are basically doing the same thing as in they're providing support, they're reaching out to neighbors, they're uh, organizing to um, support the resilience of communities, but they're doing it with the tone and, and the inflection of something that's a lot more akin to like David Cameron's vision of the big society or um, the sort of like more sort of um, conventional approach to charity. And I think why I think that's important is because as well as exposing the vulnerabilities that predate coronavirus, um, as John mentioned, including like, the safety welfare net and racial disparities and who this is affecting or the econo economic um, in inequality of how this is affecting people, whether or not it's the sort of like the rad more radical take or the big society take of how people are mobilizing around this, I think in either manifestation, it is having an effect on our relationships to one another. Like I consider myself relatively engaged and involved and work in a community in a community facing organization, but I didn't really barely know anybody on my street until all of this has happened. Mm -hmm. And now um, I think that why this matters is that through, through this shared experience of adversity, we're seeing lots of people thinking, oh, maybe I should join a trade union or what's a trade union? Now I need help at work. Maybe I'm gonna get involved in a campaigning group or maybe I'm gonna participate in a neighborhood group, reach out to my family and all of that. And I think on a local level, why that happens, uh, the significance of that is that our experience of government in many ways, apart from the politics of government, our experience of it on a local level is where we feel it in the most visceral way. And so that's, that's our amenities, uh, you know, everything from the streets, parks, everything else, social care, particularly adult social care, which has been in crisis, policing, housing, the council housing waiting list, the enforcement standards in the private rental sector. And all of these things are now sort of like under pressure and have been under pressure for a long time, um, at, least for, at least for the past 10 years and probably before that. Uh, and I think the big question why that we're going to sort of, uh, how these relationships are going to interact with that is that we've just gone through 10 years of austerity. Now we're saying, oh, are, are the government acting like socialists? I think what we're seeing basically is a bailout as, as we saw in 2008. And then the question is, as John pointed out, there's going to be a struggle about what happens next, who's going to pay for this and who's going to burden that. And the, I think the really interesting question on a local level is that what form that the relationships that we've built now through this mutual aid organizing effort what form that, that takes when we have next year's local elections, when we have um, the sort of like debates around the sort of uh, 
the who's going to bear the brunt or the cost of the massive economic contraction that we're going to face and whether or not this potential or nascent renewal of community bonds and relationships that people often talk about has been lost over the past 30 years for various reasons um, is going to sort of like make communities more resilient more powerful and be having potentially more expansive demands on those that represent us, those that spend tax money and those that make political decisions beyond this sort of like emergency phase. And so like the comparison to 2008, um, I think there's going to be definitely going to be a struggle and like a politicization of many people around this issue. And that's happening at national level uh, with people reading the news. But I also think it's happening on a much more sort of like emotional and visceral level as well as we engage with one another. And the question is, is like, how will that impact um the, the the response of individuals voters communities when when we come to face the next phase thank you so much for that adam um i want to bring in some of our members now i can see cat d has a hand up and then i definitely want to go to robson after that who has got a different point of view and the point of a thinking i should have said is um about civilized disagreement so i'm very keen to hear what robson has to say as well but cat d first are you there Kat, are you there? Oh, I heard a little rustle on the line. Kat, can you hear us? Okay, let's come to Robson and then hopefully we'll get Kat in a minute. Um, Hiya, how are you? I'm good, thank you. How are you? Yeah, good, thanks. Good. Um, I'll start off with how I feel. I don't think it'll change. I think we're not... Um, I was just talking a uh, minute ago about how we've had situations like this before in 2000 in we'll have the same economic we'll have a recession like we did in 2000 what happened my town was forgotten about and I think we saw the anger of that in 2016 um, I, I'm from Grimsby you know that probably because I've come to think of when you come and host them there um, you can talk about mayors but when we are MPs the Tory MPs that were elected have recently told us that we can't have we have voted against actually us having an elected mayor in, in Humberside being elected. So we, we can talk about how this is going to change anything. I don't think it does. I don't think we'll have the government stepping in. I think we'll see the same thing. It'll be the effects the companies won't the major companies won't pay. It'll be smaller businesses. It'll be us uh, I'm 16 uh, 17 now and it'll be my generation who were very angry about how this and we've been angry for a very long time this since this has just been okay we're going to be forgotten again and i think we don't know what's going to happen we've been told what's going to happen with our exams now the my the year above me are doing a levels the year below are doing gcse's but we are still in the dark about a lot of things the government are not gonna we're not going to change how we're governed we'll still have it makes no sense for them to change how we are governed because it's got them in power and it's got them what they wanted Robson, thank you for that. I think you just demonstrated the point that John made earlier about kind of the levelling up agenda will go on the back burner because we'll just be desperately not trying to level down. Um, Annie Whitehall, are you on the line? Annie, can I? Can you hear me? Yeah. Hello, have, have you got your camera on? I can see your hand up and I was just coming to you for your comment. Should we try Emma Lowe instead? Hi Emma. Are you Emma? Not, yeah. <laughs> what, what point did you want to raise Emma? Oh, we're not having any luck this time. Can someone unmute Emma? I'm unmuted now. Oh, perfect. Thank you. I completely agree with Robson. I think until we have a different way of thinking about economics, um, the, the drive, once this is over, will be to get back to normal economics as quickly as possible because all of the power structures will want to keep that in place. And until that really changes, um, I don't see it changing. And the fact that the first speaker spent so long talking about economics just underlines that to me. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Emma. Thank you very much. Is, um, is Matt Dancona there, my colleague, another editor at um, Tortoise, because he makes a similar point about the scale, scale. Of and economics. Um, Matt, what do you think? Well, I think it's been so interesting so far. I mean, 
to put my dime in. Um, I mean, I guess the thing is that the 20th century was a, an argument between um, statism and, in all its forms and liberalism. And the assumption in 1989 when the wall came down was that liberalism had won and it would be varieties of liberalism, uh, whether libertarianism on the right or social democracy on the centre left, that would kind of, that would be the new and fairly narrow bandwidth of political contestation. Um, the interesting thing I think about, um, about what's happening now is that, um, I think Adam's right, it's not about socialism, it's about statism. Um, that what you're gonna see is different varieties of statism. And the interesting thing about the, the conservative conversion to statism is that it isn't the same as the left wing conception of statism. It's about, uh, I mean, a lot of what we're now seeing is really a radically expanded form of what Boris Johnson uh, was already doing before the pandemic. Um, uh, very influenced by Trump and Steve Bannon in America and their belief that this is a time to be borrowing because uh, credit is cheap. And the commitment to infrastructure, to the NHS and to levelling up, which I agree with John, I think levelling up will, will go to the wall because there'll be so many other demands on on the exchequer. Um, but I do think that um, in, the, in the decades to come, we are gonna see, um, if you like, a, a, a competition to define what modern government looks like. Government will be hugely important in our lives, more, more so than it has been even, you know, since the creation of the NHS. Um, the, the, the nature, the, the whole nature of the NHS is, is presently going through a kind of um, very, very, uh, short term but but incredibly intense national debate because clearly as Chris Cook pointed out in that brilliant piece for Tortoise uh, last week you know the NHS lacks the capacity that it needs we're also seeing I think one of the round two stories of this will be the horrific discovery of the state of our social care system and we're going to have to come to some sort of to use John's imagery some sort of new contractual arrangement about how we fund that I think that it will have implications for the way we approach climate change. I think some people will see a justification of protectionism and um, national resilience as against uh, um, glo global efficiency and supply chains. There'll be a huge debate around that. So I don't think it's certain where this will land. But um, again, to echo John, I think it is all up for grabs. But the, the terrain is not the terrain of the 80s or the 90s or even the Cameron era. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a different map, that one. And to speak to Robson's point, I think that the, uh, one of the elements in that, the resolution of that, will be a very strong generational, intergenerational dimension, um, which you know, could be benignly resolved or not. But I think his generation has, has a, a series of very legitimate grievances, which range from property to climate to residual anger over Brexit. I think all of that will feed into a very strong um, and, and probably quite fractious debate between the generations. But I think it is going to be very different. I think the, the, the next few years are going to be fantastically hard uh, and uh, overwhelmingly to do with getting the economy back into some sort of shape where you know, it, there, is, there is reasonable levels of employment, a reasonable tax base. We'll be borrowing like crazy. Um, uh, so it's going to be, it's, I think, to, to borrow again the wartime uh, metaphor, which can get very hackneyed, I know, I think this is, in fact, the phony war, and that when we emerge blinking from our hutches, um, whenever that, that is, that's when it will start to get really hard. Um, Matt, at the risk of this uh, turning into our own private um, news meeting, um, Matt and I have been working on a project for the last few months yeah. called The Rules, where we've been trying to look at um, how, if you were to go about um, putting together a written constitution, um, what would people want to see in it, um, the principles that you'd want to follow. Matt, what, how do you think that project tallies with this moment? Um, John was talking about kind of everything being up for grabs, but what, what's going to happen over the coming months to well, I, I, I think, grand bargain? 
yeah, I mean, I think two things are really important. I mean, we were talking earlier, probably about, you know, the, the, the importance of the rules and how actually, though we've kind of um, gone, laid off the gas pedal on them a bit during the, the last few weeks, it, they start, the re their relevance is starting to appear greater than ever. And I guess one of the things that we've discovered during the thinkings we've done uh, on the road about uh, the rules was that it wasn't just a question of it, in how institutions interrelate, it's to do with the broader social contract. And I think that is fundamental. And that's why it's so important that, that, that there's a local and a localist dimension to this. Um, I also think that, you know, just to, to take a very narrow example, the, the drama of the last two days and um, terrible uh, situation with the Prime Minister being in intensive care has been a perfect illustration of how uh, actually we don't have a rule book. Um, you know, people are genuinely not quite sure what Dominic Raab's powers are. We don't have an official position of Deputy Prime Minister. We don't have the equivalent of the 25th Amendment uh, of the American Constitution. So although I'm sure that the government machine will roll on, I don't, I don't suppose that, you know, cabinet government will collapse. It's interesting that, that um, something that was actually, you know, I mean, it's terrible and awful and one, one wishes him well, and it's good to hear that he's doing better. Um, but it wasn't actually ridiculous to suppose that senior members of the government would get incapacitated during this pandemic, and, and lots of them have and the Prime Minister most, you know, wretchedly. Um, and so it's, it's extraordinary that in that very British way, we're, we're kind of doing it on the hoof. And, you know, Dominic Raab looked like a, a startled sixth former as he was explaining that he was sort of in charge, he hadn't spoken to the Prime Minister since Saturday. He was deputising where relevant. Um, it doesn't inspire confidence. And I think it makes the case for um, things like that needing a much greater degree of codification and formality. Um, thank you, Matt. Every time I look in the chat, people are agreeing with Jessica Van Meer. So we better hear what Jessica has to say. Are you there? Hi, Jess. Uh, can we? Can you turn the audio on? There we go. Hi. Go. Sorry, I wasn't um, expecting to speak. And that's okay. It's just it's just everybody was agreeing with you so much. I thought oh, I need to hear what you have to say. Um, well, I was saying that I agree with what Emma said, and I, I fear that what people's takeaway is going to be from this crisis is uh, this is a, a temporary disruption to our economic system, and that when we get out of this, we need to go back to, uh, as quickly as possible, uh, returning to endless economic growth, that this is just, you know, a slight downfall, and we need to get back to where we were rather than viewing this as a lesson to be learned about the flaws in our existing economic system and how easily it can cause devastation if uh, just one link in the economic global chain is broken. Um, and I think that there are some different economic models uh, that are worth discussing out of this um, in imagining uh, a global economic system that wouldn't be so easily uh, collapsed by a crisis in one part of the world. Um, and I think degrowth theories um, discuss this and point to the potential for having more local economic systems um, that would be focused on ensuring sustainable well-being rather than endless growth. Um, but I don't know if that's the solution, so I'd be interested in hearing what other people think about that. And do you have a view, Jessica, on, on if, if there is going to be a reset in this process, how that reset happens? If you want to get these things on the agenda, you know, I, 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 what's up? Um, John talked about kind of all these questions being up for grabs at the moment. What, what do you think the process is for having this? That's a really difficult question. Um, I mean, one thing that makes me optimistic is I think that um, some of the government benefits that people are getting um, from this crisis that people previously thought were radical or impossible or socialist, um, that people will become used to that and it will be seen as a possibility for them coming out of this. Um, so for example, I'm from the US um, and the government is about to send everyone $1,200 checks, um, which previous to this crisis, um, I know there's been a lot of talk about you know, universal basic income, but 
um, people, at least in the United States, viewed that as a very radical idea. And the idea of the government sending you a check was seen as um, a handout. But I think that if we as a society have collectively gone through the experience of receiving that, and mm -hmm. we've also collectively seen how good we are to other parts of society and how the health of other people is connected to the health of ourselves and how the well-being of others in our, in our society is essential to our own well-being. Um, that coming out of this crisis, proposals for those kinds of ideas won't be seen as quite as radical. I think there will be more support. So I think there's room for progressive social movements to uh, push for those ideas as we come out of this. But I think that the timing has to be right mm -hmm. um, and that they that people need to take advantage of the window of opportunity that we will have coming out of this crisis to push for change. Mm, thank you for that. Thank you. Um, we come to Yasmin Midhat. Oh, hey. Uh, hi, hi Yasmin. Hello. What was the point you wanted to make? I so I broadly wanted to agree with what was said before, but um, perhaps add a couple of additional bits of food for thought, because I think a lot of the conversations that I've heard around you know, how will we be governed in the future and so on have in, in these sorts of circles have been very much within the framework of pre-existing ideas. The much more radical thinking has been, you know, from First Nations communities, from radical black feminists, um, from folks who I think live out on the margins of, of the current um, political orthodoxy. And I, and I do worry that, um, well, part of my concern is, as mentioned before, this will be seen as an interruption rather than as an example of how things could be done um, and and our bias as collectives is to be like okay there's an emergency we can ha we can have emergency things happen now that but that can't be the way that things always go that we can't actually move the ideas of what is normal um, and so i i i i worry about our, our kind of diet of our ideas where are we getting the ideas from um, and why to me are the really radical ideas, the ones that don't look at just sort of more Western orthodoxies, um, why they don't seem to be informed by those ideas sitting at the margins, the, the, the much more um, collectivist and post-colonial ideas that I've been hearing about. And may, maybe um, over the next 18 months, things will change. But part of my concern is the kind of conversations that we're having here are people who are in positions of power. And most of the people in this conversation are in positions of power, like structurally. Um, I certainly, um, you know, was born in Sudan and, and that meant that I got a particular lot in life, but um, have grew up in Australia where social mobility allowed me to be in a conversation like this. And I have a real concern that we're not actually, when we talk about how we're governed, we're not also talking about how we radically change um, the geopolitics and the, the, the power dynamics uh, of the world globally. And we're not having a conversation where we're actually saying, how, how do we shift the fact that eight people have as much wealth in this world as the bottom 50%? That is not changing at all in any of the bargains that we're talking that's a about. Really, that's a really important point. And if you'll allow me a very brief plug, one of the things we do at Tortoise is um, we have something called the Tortoise Network, where we do funded memberships to bring people into these conversations who wouldn't normally be heard in these conversations and we go out and do think ins like this with groups of people who you don't really normally hear from so that's how we are really tackling the diversity in these conversations um, I wanted to kind of thank you very much for that I just wanted to shift gears slightly and come to Josiah Mortimer from the electoral reform um, group who um, who I think it's you know, the, the missing bit in what we're talking about, if we, if, if we see a, a big potential for this big conversation that John um, painted about how we're governed. And Adam um, talked about the kind of burgeoning um, uh, civil society and um, voluntary groups that are thirsty for a stake in this. Um, um, Josiah, how do we need to change our electoral systems and, and our, our democracy to, to tally those two things after this? Have we got another uh, mic problem? 
Yeah, I think we do. Oh, that's a shame. Just like um, uh, if if one of my colleagues can maybe message Josiah and see whether we can sort that out. Let's come to Alan Morris in the meantime. Alan, are you there? Am I going to be luckier with Alan? Hello, hi. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I, no, I think I think I'm I'm muted. I think can I can hear. You now? Brilliant. Okay, right. So, yeah, um, a couple of things. Um, we've been talking a lot about how things might change, and a lot of it how we'd like them to change. Uh, we haven't spoken a much about how change happens. Mm. Um, and if we take the analogy of uh, climate change, uh, um, a, lot, a lot of things should have happened be because of the climate emergency, and they haven't. Uh, in, and in the last sort of 12 to 18 months, there's been a lot of political action to, um, to get, more, uh, get more change. And it has had some effect. It has changed the mood. It has changed the political thinking. But even so, it's only for 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 all all the fuss that's been made and the protests, um, things have only changed uh, a, a little. So uh, a, a lot more has got to change in in, um, in our political setup for. Um, uh, anything to, to change. I'm agreeing with most other people. I think thing, most things um, will will revert to how, how, how they have been. Um, and the, the, it, I, I think another thing, it might depend on the time scale of how long the restrictions last. Things changed after the First and Second World War, but they, they were sort of four or six years long, whereas this might not, might not be long enough for uh, things to things to really change mm, thank you for that i actually wanted to take that point back to john for a moment um john mcturnan and um, what um so, so what, how, how does change happen we know there was big change after the second world war um but what, what are the options for um you know how is how could this play out everything's up for grabs how could it play out so look i am um... I think one thing you need to think about the changes in the after the, in, during the First World War, during the Second World War, is how lasting those settlements were that were constructed within within those periods of crisis. So it's not really the longevity, I suspect. I think it's the fact decisions are made within a crisis moment. So take the um, uh, take the First World War. People can laugh a bit about you know licensing hours uh, were introduced during the First World War because of munitions workers drinking at lunchtime. So that's why for, um, for the younger people uh, in the audience, which is a really large number, I'm glad to see, you know, it used to be that pubs closed at three o'clock in the afternoon uh, in England and two o'clock in Scotland uh, to make munitions workers go back to the munitions plants. Those temporary restrictions brought in on, on pubs in the, in the First World War lasted till the 1980s. Uh, the Whitley councils were brought in, which were a form of negotiation with organised labour. Uh, those were brought in in the um, uh, in the in the First World War, and they were um, uh, they they were uh, they last till the eighties as well. So it, it, I th I think it's not about the length of time of the crisis; it's the fact that something's done in the crisis. It's done maybe to buy off an interest group. It's maybe done to constrain behaviour. So I think the welfare changes will be lasting. And I think what's the interesting thing that's up for grabs, as I said at the beginning, the up for grabs thing is, what is the claim that people want to make? Because what we're talking about is the future. And although you can say, as William Gibson did, the future's here already, it's just unevenly distributed. What is it the claim we want to make on the future? So what is it we want? I think we know the housing, social care, um, the pension system, the welfare system, we've known those are issues. This crisis brings them all together and probably makes more people exposed to those problems uh, in a very short space of time than before. So the answer will go not to the best policy answer, not to the most powerful one, 
but the one that's available. And I think the various people have touched on this in really interesting ways. Uh, how do you build a new progressive social movement? As Jessica was talking about progressive social movements. Well, the, the answer is, this is going to be a mixture of this new world we're living in, where we're all you know, in video conferencing, and the old world, where we know face-to-face -face is how you build a movement, how you volunteer, how you work in your community. How do you bring these things together? And so there's an organizational race as well. How do you marry the new demands to the new technologies, to the new, to the new circumstances? And that is in the end where the race goes to. It goes to the person who is, like we've said this before, the most opportunistic, the most agile, but also the ones who are clearest about purpose. And I think to go back to my con talking about business, I'm seeing some businesses taking so much pain, they're closing. There's some businesses which are studiedly hibernating and other businesses which are pivoting with purpose. And I kind of think that's, that, that's those three buckets are where most of us are. Um, you know, things are going to stop, things are going to hibernate, things are going to pivot into purposeful change. And it's how you make that into a movement and what the demands of those movement are and how those are, how those become things. You know, building a movement is the most difficult thing in the world. Uh, when Simon Stevens became NHS chief executive, he said, we're not a service, we're a movement. Uh, he's waited for a long time, but 700,000 people volunteering is the proof that his insight was right. The NHS is and should be a movement. So what are the other dimensions of that? Right down to uh, the, you know, the, what we talked at the very beginning, uh, the, what is the local organizing? But it's kind of, what's the thread that connects? What ladders up from local organizing to the big debate? What connects people to the trade unions? What the agents have changed? Thank you so much. I'm now going to ask a hundred people to cross their fingers, and we're going to go to Josiah and hope that um, we can get Josiah on the line. Josiah Mortimer. Oh, can you hear me? Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Good. Thank you for uh, bearing with the gremlins. I actually wanted to go back to something that Matt said earlier, which is just how sort of on the hoof the governance response has been to this crisis. I mean. In many ways, the response that we've seen from Parliament has, I guess, reflected the sort of creaking constitutions that constitution that we do have. You know, it's a kind of new pathogen meets old politics. And on and John sort of mentioned, you know, we're experiencing a sort of new world of technology. I mean, Parliament is very much, you know, more new to that than, than anybody. Um, you know, the initial response was to pretend that nothing was happening as the crisis started, and numbers attending started to, to plummet. And as a result, I think many voters were left quite voiceless um, as MPs were unable to turn up. Representation therefore collapsed. Um, so under pressure, Parliament did actually start to respond. I mean, the Electoral Reform Society, who I work with, um, 100 MPs, did actually get Parliament to, to modernise quite rapidly, which was positive to see. Um, we've, you know, we've now got all MPs and peers uh, who've been handed Zoom logins. Um, select committees during recess are now allowed to um, meet digitally. Um, but, you know, people have raised the, the bigger questions of governance here, and I think that's really crucial. Um, you know, just in the very immediate term, we've, we do have quite a, a strong lack of scrutiny during this crisis. Um, Parliament broke early for recess, just as enormous new powers were handed uh, to the government. Um, so although actions must now be taken very swiftly during the crisis, I think everyone recognises that we have to make sure that we do that democratically. Um, and I think when Parliament returns, it's up to opposition, we've got a new Labour leader and the government to agree to ways of making this work if we're still in the middle of the crisis. Um, it was interesting to see only today that Wales had their um, had a first ever sort of live broadcast all Zoom uh, assembly session there. Um, we do need to see that, I think, for, for Parliament when it returns to ensure that both MPs who represent us um, and, you know, their staff are, are safe. But I think, you know, looking longer term, there's, a, there's two ways that this could go. One is uh, more centralisation across the world. We're seeing governments handed sweeping new powers and a tendency to sort of centralise and hoard those powers. Um, you know, uh, uh, might we see uh, governments hold on to these powers longer than, than is necessary? New surveillance sorts of um, methods of data gathering among the population, you know, governments holding on to that. 
So that is one quite troubling path that we might be heading towards, and I think we all have to be vigilant to that. And particularly in Britain, which has been described as, a, as an elective dictatorship in the past, there's a real need for citizens to sort of stand up to that tendency, I think. And the other is the much more positive thing that some speakers have touched on, which is this sort of new uh, invigoration of com communities, um, this sense of community empowerment and engagement. And unfortunately, the British state, the way it's structured, just doesn't allow for many communities and voices to be, be heard in the long run. So I think there's a real question for all of us in terms of how do we ensure that those voices are, are heard um, and institutionalized? Because there's a real risk that they just go back to, back to normal, as it were, unengaged, and trust in politics continues to fall off a cliff. Um, so that requires some real political reforms, I think. Um, obviously, at the ERS, we push for proportional representation to make sure everyone's heard. But I think it will also require a shift in how we do democracy more generally, and that means deepening democracy, looking at things like citizens' assemblies, and a move to more deliberative, participatory forms of engagement, which you know, I think is so, so vital now, and indeed, after this crisis is over. When we, you raised, when we spoke earlier on the phone, you raised a really interesting idea about having a citizens assembly to essentially monitor the government through this process, just to have some of that direct um, democracy and accountability that is difficult. I mean, I'd, like the idea of a citizens assembly on Zoom does my head in a little bit, but um, um, what, um, do you think something like that would work? Yeah, I mean, we've, we've I think, you know, there's been a real shift to talking about m more different forms of democracy, I should say, um, than just the sort of standard, you know, you turn up at the polling station every five years and put your cross in a box. I think, you know, the way that society has shifted, you know, the enorm enormous amounts of money that's being spent and the huge decisions that are being made every day that affect people's lives, um, people are going to want to have a stake in that. And I think, you know, it's been really positive to see all the new forms of mutual aid and community activism that's been going on. This crisis isn't gonna be over in two months. The, the ramifications of the huge spending that's taken place, you know, the life-changing decisions that have been made and the new funding that's, um, who pays for this, all this money that's gone in. Those are really huge political decisions, which I don't think people are just gonna sit down and, you know, shut up. Uh, once this is over, they're going to want to have a stake in that. So I think citizens' assemblies are, are one way of doing that. But I think the other thing is just that this, this crisis has laid bare really important questions about where power lies um, in terms of where re resources are distributed. You know, areas saying that they, they've been underfunded for years for, for different reasons. Their services have been cut. You know, why is that? What are the, what are the processes behind our politics that, that make these disparities in, in power really clear? Thank you for that. Can you come to Megan Kenyon? Yeah, she's had her hand up for a while. Megan, hi. Hi. Um, I just had one point. Um, I wanted to make. I actually kind of made it. I was in the um open news meeting yesterday. Um, but I personally think that British politics is just too married to, to tradition. Um, and I think that mainly starts with the physical building of Parliament itself and how it's been in need of renovations for so long and it's such a hazard and yet nothing has really been done um, and I personally think that if there were um, changes to be made to the physical building then maybe things would start to progress and we'd realise oh wait we're not that married to tradition and we can make this sort of gradual change anyway. Um, so yeah, I just think, I think that the physical building of Parliament is so important and the fact that MPs aren't in there at the moment and they're doing things digitally, I think that could be a good first step to maybe starting to make change. So, Thank yeah. you, Megan. Um, if we've got just 90 seconds to seek my colleague Chris Cook in, because every time I start to think I know what I think about something, um, Chris, who I have very similar politics and thinking to generally, thinks the opposite. So I want to know what Chris is thinking now. So I think the um, the safest bet in like British political history is that is basically conservatism. I don't mean that in sort of the party political sense. I mean that in the sense of that if you look at what the state delivers and what it does and doesn't do, it's surprisingly static. So you know, Nye Bevan resigned over. Uh, eyeglasses and dentist charges and 
you know, we've had um, toing and froing about prescription charges. We've had controversy in the last few years about are hospitals allowed to charge for uh, car parking, right? The, the, there are areas where the state has changed radically what, um, what, uh, what it's done. So, you know, universities, uh, early years, those, those are two obvious things where it sort of changed its role. Um, but generally, we have kind of a fairly conservative idea about what the government is for, and then it, and we just have an argument kind of about how to deliver it. That's sort of how British politics seems to work. So you can, you can't, this isn't my, you know, desire, but you can entirely see how we could move to a world where we pay, say, 25p is the basic rate of tax, so, you know, substantially higher, higher chunk of cash. We have basically better fund, the, the same sort of services, better funded, delivered in pretty similar ways. Um, so I think you can, and I think actually the, 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 our track record basically on responding to disaster with, with, um, with radicalism is pretty, you know, we all keep going, but we have to go back to 1945 to find it, you know, happening. It's amazing. We went through a, you know, this crisis of capitalism 13 years ago and, you know, you know, what happened? I mean, the politics didn't respond to that. Um, you can entirely see it not responding to this. You can end up with a politics that's sort of the same sort of party divisions, just around a marginally bigger state. Thank you, Chris. And um, I, on that note, we are out of time. Um, so at the end of uh, thinking, it's my job to wrap up the conversation we've had and to talk a little bit about how we're going to take this conversation into our future journalism. Um, and, um, you know, what John said at the start, um, everything's up for grabs, feels like a really powerful statement, despite what Chris says that we're actually very conservative and we don't change very much. I actually think everything is up for grabs because uh, so much has changed in such a short amount of time. When you look at a conservative government um, uh, bailing out companies and paying wages and nationalizing vast parts of the uh, business sector, it's, it's um, um, the, the, the change is, is really dizzying. Um, but the main thing I wanted to say is how we'll take this forward into our journalism. I think for me and Matt Dancona, my fellow editor, this probably puts our project on the rules of politics back on our agenda and to have that conversation. Because I don't know if everything is up for grabs, how that plays out in the coming months and, and, and years and, and how that conversation is had and what, what we can do to influence it by doing some of that thinking in that project, the rules. Um, and um, my colleague um, Liz Mosley, our members editor, who was in the chat through all of this, also mentioned the fact that we're looking to do a series of thinkings of, on life after COVID. And people here have mentioned other parts of the state that have changed radically in this short period and could change more. So um, this has been the most fascinating discussion. Thank you so much to all our speakers and our members who contributed so much. Um, if you're not already a member of Tortoise, do download the Tortoise app and you get a free 30 day trial to read all of our journalism and sign up to more thinkings. Um, but thank you very much for today's contributions and um, good evening, have a good evening. Thanks. <laughs>